So how are you guys? Pretty good. Good. Good? Good. Yeah. So the record is called The Unauthorized Biography of Reinhold Messner. So I guess the first question that everybody wants to know is, who is Reinhold Messner? Reinhold Messner is <clears throat> the name that me and my friends in high school used on a fake ID. We had this poster board of an Arizona driver's license when we were 17, and the name was Reinhold Messner, and we were born in like 62 or something absurd, and we were, we all had it. <laughs> so it would be like a chain of five 17-year-old guys going to bars at night with the same name, and so that's who Reinhold Messner Reinhold Messner is the patron they called saint it, of one, underage drinking. One night I got, <laughs> one night I, I went to jail after I got beat up, <laughs> and uh, I don't know how that works, but it worked for me, and, and, and the cop, I gave him my fake ID because it's all I had on me, and he, I, heard, I remember hearing him call it in, uh, Reinhold Messner, uh, age, ni uh, you know, birthday, 1962, so. But he looks more like he's 16. Yeah. So do you guys know who the, do you, do you know that there actually is a Reinhold Messner? We're not sure if there is. There must know. be somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there is. Do you know one? Who's there the, is. Well, I, I don't know him personally, <laughs> but um, the, apparently Reinhold, the, the real Reinhold Messner, maybe, he uh, was the first guy to climb Mount Everest without oxygen. Without wow. Oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> we lucked out there. <laughs> really? Is he still alive? I believe he is. Wow, we, we need to get in touch with him. Yeah, really, that's like amazing. When did you, know, you find that out? Yeah, you know, well, I, I went on the web and I did a, re a, a search for Ryan Messner. Messner. Great. And uh, that is that's incredible. Wow, we could put a mountain. We could do like a sort of you more do a mountaineering it. kind of promotional. I don't, it together. was so long ago. That I yeah. don't I don't remember how we arrived at that name, but I remember like all, all of us laughing, but to the point of tears. But it must have been something like somebody come across that or seen that because yeah. that sounds like one of my friends would have done that but I don't I don't have no, I have no he was watching of that. biography when he's stoned or something and he's kind of that's great so um army how did the song um thought about the army come about that was actually um written as a second uh movement to this suite which hospital song was the first a hospital song used to be longer and my idea of going into to army was much more abrupt than we ended up doing in fact we for a while we changed the first chord of well i thought about the army to match the hospital song it was this kind of nasty abrupt sort of i don't know what kind of chord that was a a, a 7 12 13 backwards chord flat five flat five is that all it was yeah, it was 7, 12, 13, backwards, flat 5. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what it was. But uh, um, I don't know. I was just thinking when, once I got on the hospital kick lyrically, I was just going, okay, what do you think about when, if, you're, if you're just laid in the hospital? And just kind of be a writer for a second. And uh, and then I was thinking, well, I guess you just think about stuff. Yeah. What did I think about? Well, I remember I was going to join the Army to get through school. And I told my father that, and, and he said, do you... And high. And that's the way exactly what he said. Are there any new guests? Any guests on the new album? Yes, there are. A couple members of the Squirrel and Zippers play horns on Army. Uh, Antoine and Lorenza. Yeah, just, there's and string Jimmy. section of some of the part of the string section we carried on the road with us for a while was on. John Painter played horns on it too. Right. We can promote him. He's from painters from the band Fleming and John. Fleming and John. Mm -hmm. That's right. 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 Give him a you know. That's right. Give him a little. Fleming shout and out. John. Their singles out now. <laughs> <laughs> the Pearl. The Pearl. Sixty ads at secondary top forty <laughs> radio on your desk. The second song, "Don't Change Your Plans," is that song is an amazing song. How did you guys come to create that song? Ben, ben and our producer on. did yeah. a lot of work on that song. Yeah, Caleb kind of like we we played it one day. Like Ben had this thing he's been working on for a long time, and the the, the, the instrumental section, which did it end up in the song? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I had to think about <laughs> for that a second. I went, Wait a minute, it didn't even end up. It, but it, it may end up on the floor. We for the we went out one oh. day and we came back, and Caleb had completely changed the arrangement and cut it up. So a lot of that was his influence that it turned out the way it did, especially from the very beginning of the song. So. Yeah, the, f the form of the song. It was yeah. yeah. I guess it was probably like three songs, and then it became. One song, and then, and then half of that was cut out, and it was like, you know, well, we kind of messed with it for a while. Caleb wanted it to be more of a hit, 
and 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 hear it that way. I never heard the song that way ever once. And then uh, when we came to the studio one day, he had chopped the beginning of the song, which had been this long instrumental thing, just cut it away. And then all of a sudden, it was this pop song. I was like, oh, okay, that's what you're talking about. Because <laughs> I didn't hear it like that at all. I just heard his little, you know, this little masterpiece thing. I was working on. Next, um, your sound is like none other. Who are your biggest influences? It's huge. Influences are from from 70s FM radio to soul, radio. soul music to to watching in, discovering indie rock to this I mean Nirvana had a big Nirvana had a big influence that. on us when we started bigger than Elton John did you know and Burt Bacharach now has a bigger influence on us than than the Pixies or there's this whole pop thing that was kind of centered around um, the Burt Bacharach sound. It set a kind of tone. It's probably the reason I remember the last part of the 60s being like three years old is because it's uh, got that flugelhorn sound in your head. For some reason I want to think about um, like Volkswagens and uh, uh, mustard colored uh, uh, curtains. I don't know why. And then women had their hair a certain way. It's really a domestic sound. It's not. But it's not the kind of thing you listen to. Yeah, it's not Papa's got a brand new bag or anything, mm. you know. But, uh, but it's, it's totally true. I mean, that's like your first impression of pop music, you know. What the world needs S now. Sincere white bum, people bum, music. Bum, bum. So, um, Darren, you wrote a pair, you wrote Magic? Mm-hmm. What was the inspiration for that? How do you get in the mind to write songs? Um, I get really high. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that song is kind of a composite of uh, people that I've known that have died, more or less. And <clears throat> it's also a love song. So that's pretty much it. Was there like a theme to this record at all? Like a sequencing theme, perhaps? Or we were just bouncing off walls, just seeing which way it was <clears> gonna <throat> lead, which way. Because I think we all kind of felt like it was gonna be kind of concept record-ish. It was gonna be that tent to it. But then, what's your concept? And there was a lot of lot of kind of themes that were floating around. There was this kind of dream kind of sleeping theme for a while. In fact, there were probably three or four songs cut off the record that were all related to things that happened at night. And uh, those kind of either didn't get recorded or they got recorded and cut off and kind of kept on going around until it started to begin, began to sound like a, um, like a life story after a while. So that's when we came up with autobiography, I mean the biography of Reinhold. Um, and Mess, it's great. I love the rhythm. The rhythm section just kind of gallops along. Now is that a harp? Is there a harp chord on that? It sounds like no. That's a like that's a um, that's an upright piano with a, a, a kind of this tack thing in it. It's not a tack piano, but it's kind of like a tack piano. Mm -hmm. Little pieces of metal between the hammers and the strings. It's like one of those honky tonk. Yeah, if you play those uh, um, a way you wouldn't expect to hear it, like if you don't play Scott Joplin on it, they start to sound really cool. I and mean, it's not good for Scott Joplin too, but you you're used to that. Yeah, yeah. Stephen Foster. Right. Yeah, it's fun to play dramatic stuff on. So, what's the most messed up thing that ever happened to you while you were on tour? The most messed up thing. We did play a metal bar, and that f***ing sucked. Was that the one in Dallas? Mm, no, I'm thinking Perth. that's the that was there was one in Phoenix. I, I don't know if you remember this, but this guy grabbed my hand and wouldn't let go while we were playing. It in was Phoenix? Kind of, in Phoenix, Arizona. <gasps> oh, God. I ended God. up pulling him over the monitor, and, and, uh, and, and I just looked up at Trey, and he was laughing because I was going to, I was, I mean, I, I'm not a fighter. I was going to kick him in the head because I was so mad, and then I realized it's probably not a good idea. I probably would die for that. And I looked up, and one of our guys that works with us, Trey, was just laughing. And that was a twisted moment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this guy was disgusting. Right. He was horrible. We were having horrible uh, PA system problems, and I was sick. I guess that's not very interesting, but that's kind of messed up. It's hard to remember. Everything's messed up on the road. How do you remember that? Are you going to be touring to promote this record? We're going to, uh, we're going to start it to uh, some college shows and that sort of thing and then <clears> move, into, move into clubs, just see you know, see how it goes and stuff. But uh, there's some big plans. You know? We're going to go back to Japan, go to Australia, go to your, our usual crowd. So Redneck Pass, then, um, it's about your red, Redneck Pass. Are you a Redneck band? <laughs> oh, totally. 
Absolutely. I grew, I grew up right in the sticks with a bunch of kids souping up our cars and stuff like that. Honestly, that song's not really that much about anything. I think it's a, it's kind of a it's a good concept and any way I went about it sounded very finger pointy. So I thought I would just feel really fun as possible in the in the verses and uh, and get try to get to a point in in the choruses. It's probably the only song on the album that really doesn't have a, a really heartfelt point to it. But it's a lot of fun and it's a, it's a relief to have fun like that without a point to it.